I'm going to get started. Um, I'm Clem Sanderson from the Soil Association, uh, working, well, I'm based in Glasgow, actually, working from home. Um, and we're joined by some lovely farmers who hopefully you will have met through their videos that they've been doing. Um, and I'm really, really pleased to be hosting this Pasture Power event um, in collaboration with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. Um, as we'd really like to work more together with lots of common goals that we have. Um, and uh, so I'll just give a quick rundown of what's going to be happening this evening. And there'll be a quick presentation and then we'll get on to the conversation and the questions. So um, I'm really pleased to be joined by some fabulous farmers who you can see on your screen, who are all part of the Mob Grazing Scotland group. Um, and Doug and Andrea and Charlie and Nikki and James have been sharing some videos over the last few weeks and I think that's been a real learning curve for everybody but we hope you've enjoyed them. If, if you haven't seen the short videos they're all available through the Soil Association website and also uh, on the Facebook group that we've set up Mob Grazing Scotland uh, so hopefully some of you have seen them through that. Uh, one of the things I think we've learned throughout the mob grazing group um, is that we're all learning. I think the farmers will probably all agree with that. So although they're here to answer your questions tonight, every farm is unique and uh, there's no uh, perfect way to do this kind of grazing system. So just bear that in mind. We'll, we'll, they'll, they'll be talking about their different systems um, and hopefully you can gain some insights, but uh, everyone's the expert on their own farm, as Rob Havard would say. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just give a quick overview of the work of the Soil Association and the Mob Grazing Group and then I'll pass over to Johnny who's going to talk a bit about the PFLA um, and he's also a member of the Mob Grazing Group so he knows everyone well uh, and then the conversation will start chaired by Emily Grant who's an agricultural consultant and farmer herself in Scotland. Um, and then it'll be over to your questions. So when it comes to the questions, you can start putting them in now. If you look at the Q&A box, it's the different, a different box from the chat box. You can put questions in there and we'll try and get to those later on and answer as many as we can. And feel free to continue uh, using the chat box um, if you wanna share any information or let us know any other things. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll just uh, carry on and tell you a bit about the Soil Association to start. So uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview of our Farming for the Future programme. Um, so this is just that the mission for the Soil Association is transforming the way we eat, farm and care for the natural world. And our vision is good food for all, produced with care for the natural world. And we have sort of two strands to that. One is, is around food. We're working to get good food onto the public plate in schools, hospitals and care homes. Food that's good for your health, good for the environment and good for the economy. And then the other side of our work is farming. And we work to support and enable farmers in Scotland to work with nature to build thriving, resilient businesses. And some of our key themes that we're looking at through all of our programs and events are farming with nature, uh, healthy living soils, farming with trees, uh, farm animals fed on grass and byproducts from other uh, food and drink, uh, exploring new routes to market, in particular strengthening local food economies, farmer led innovation, which is what the mob grazing group is, is part of really and good nutritious food for all in relation to diversification. And actually there's some of uh, Doug's cattle there on the right uh, in a field of clover there from last year, I believe. Uh, and these are some of our farming programs that we're running uh, at the moment. Um, some of you may have heard of the Rural Innovation Support Service or RIS uh, that's doing a lot of different innovation groups. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about the mob grazing operational group. Oh, and I just want to let you know as well about some upcoming events that my colleague um, Anna is organizing. Uh, in case you're interested, they're all on our website so you can find out more, but we're doing a Sell Local This Christmas event with the Open Food Network and Rosie Jack from the Bow House in Fife and Balkaski are involved in the mob grazing uh, group as well. 
Uh, so there's two opportunities to attend this, the same uh, workshop online webinar. And then Anna's also organizing a Money Grows on Trees event, looking at how trees can add value to your farm business. Um, so that's later on in November. So keep an eye out for those and uh, join if you like. And just to give a quick overview then of the mob grazing group. So it started as a field lab in 2018, just towards the end of the drought. Uh, and it, it started with about 15 members from across Scotland. You can see where they're located on the map there. Uh, and it was really about trying to share knowledge and um, invite in different speakers and researchers that could help really explore how mob grazing could work for farmers in their own context, how it could improve soil health, uh, animal performance, um, diversify pasture, all those kinds of things. And the group have been sharing knowledge like that um, for the last few years. And now at this stage, we're really trying to share that knowledge wider with a much wider network of farmers, crofters and land managers. And that's partly why we've got funding to run this operational group, uh, which is between July and next March. And that's very much about um, two parts to it. Um, we're trying to benchmark, monitor and measure the environmental and productivity benefits of mob grazing and really look at different farm settings, different regions, different types of soil and how it can work in these different contexts and how it can benefit biodiversity above and below ground as well as improving uh, profitability of farm businesses and also looking at the social side and the impacts it has on the family and how to run a regenerative business I suppose. So the group uh, are sharing a lot of knowledge around that. And then part of the other part of the operational group is to produce resources for a wider audience, um, which is things like this webinar and also the videos that the farmers have been making. So that's something that's a little experiment. Um, I think it's gone really well, mostly. Um, and we're trying to show directly from, from the farmer perspective uh, what what it takes to do mob grazing, um, some of the challenges, but how, really how it's working for everyone. Uh, and we're doing all of our work around this organized on monthly themes. So October was very much about pasture power um, and trying to make uh, pasture and grass systems work uh, in a mob grazing sense. And then November is gonna be much more focused on soil health and biodiversity. So you can look out for, we won't be running week, weekly videos, but we've got quite a few resources and different things to share in the next few weeks. Um, and the best way to find out what we're doing is to join the Mob Grazing Scotland Facebook group. Um, but if you're not on Facebook, you can also get updates by email or watch us on Twitter, things like that. So I think I've probably talked enough. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. That was the last one. This is very strange, not hearing anybody at all. Oh no, don't want to do that. I want to pause, no, I want to stop share. There, there we go. Okay, um, so I'll now pass over to Johnny to give us a little intro to the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you, Clem. Um, uh, my name is Johnny Balfour. Uh, I am a, a director of the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. Uh, as well as being a member of this uh, mob grazing group. Um, the Pasture Fed Livestock Association is a community of people uh, who support pasture fed ruminant agriculture. Um, we bring together farmers, butchers, uh, general public um, who are committed to producing and eating high quality food in a natural way. Uh, that benefits the soil, the animals, and uh, our own health. Um, we have a set of standards uh, underpinning uh, uh, all of this in which uh, we would like all animals to be farmed, um, uh, sorry, all ruminants to be farmed um, based on these standards uh, and consider 100% pasture fed as being the gold standard for um, uh, for quality in terms of uh, ruminants. Currently, we have, as well as umpteen uh, members of the Pasture Fed Livestock Association across Scotland, benefiting from the 
sharing knowledge. Uh, we have 10 certified producers um, uh, up and down the country. Uh, so uh, if you go to pastureforlife.org, you will be able to find somebody close to you who is um, uh, supplying um, PFLA certified beef and lamb. Um, we also work closely with other organizations which share our um, agroecological values. And that's why we're all here uh, with the Soil Association um, and uh, why we're uh, talking about improving uh, the pasture that our cattle and sheep are on. Um, so thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope you learn plenty from uh, the great guys we've got on the panel. Great, thanks, Johnny. Um, just a wee reminder before we launch into the conversation, just to, as questions come up in your mind, stick them in the Q&A box um, and feel free to continue to chat in the chat box. Um, but I will pass over to Emily to introduce yourself and then we can start hearing from the farmers. Perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Clement. Thank you for asking me to, thumbs up, <laughs> good stuff. Um, thanks for asking me to, to chair this part of the session. So as Clement mentioned, we'll probably have about half an hour or so um, of chat from the mob grazing all stars that we have here. Um, and we'll, we'll try and find out, I suppose we'll, yeah, just cover up sort of what's driving um, these farmers to, to mob graze and how are they doing it because uh, I think there's a few people out there who um, have lots of questions about mob grazing and I know that there are some people who have joined us who are pretty familiar with um, slightly more intensive rotational grazing systems but this is um, you know moving in a different direction as well so um, we'll try and cover off as much as possible and as Clem said use the chat facility because there's plenty of time for chat and um, sorry the, the Q&A because there is there is time to do that as we go through so without further ado because we need to hear from these guys um, I'm just going to ask each of the three um, I can't even say farmers but the three groups of people because we, we've obviously um, got other people involved in the businesses it's not just singular farmers which is great to see but I'm just going to ask you all just really to introduce yourself so, you know where are you what are you doing um what kind of system are you running what kind of stock are you running etc now um for convenience we'll do this in the order that you appear on my screen so first up Charlie and Andrea please although I'm not sure you really need introduction because you're quite famous but but for those who don't know Andrea and Charlie please just tell us a bit about your system. Cool thanks Emily uh, we're in the Lammermuir Hills so south about 30 miles southeast of Edinburgh uh, we are running an organic system heavily reliant on forage and uh, well on pasture I should say um, we run 110 suckler cows, native bred suckler cows, mostly Angus Cross, Welsh Black, and we run 520 wool shedding ewes. And we have been rotational grazing for the past six or seven years um, to one degree or another. Um, and we, we flirted with it previous prior to that as well. Um, we've been mob grazing just for the last couple of years with our cattle only. Um, yeah, hopefully that covers it. It was 600 to 900 feet, 30 inch rainfall, very dry soil, quite a forgiving farm in a wet time, but quite hard on us in a dry time. Great, perfect. And are you, what stage are calves on the unit till, Charlie? Are you finishing calves or how are you working it? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, they stay with us through until May. So when they're just over a year old, basically. And then steer cubs head away to a joint venture partner. And I finished there. Um, and heifer cubs either join the herd at that point or through May and June will be sold for breeding um, if they surface to our own requirements. Great. Perfect. And now I've... Yeah, sorry, and you go if there was anything you'd add. No, I was just going to say on uh, for lambs, we, we finished lambs through August, September, and October. Uh, anything else left at that point is sold store. Um, and that's so, so we don't carry uh, additional lambs through the winter. 
perfect. Okay, I have a horrible feeling that we've lost, I think Nikki and James are having broadband issues. I have a horrible feeling we've lost them temporarily. So, um, Doug, do you want to unmute yourself and say a little bit about your farm and your system? Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I farm in Fife, just outside Leven. Um, a third of the farm's organic, and that's where the and, and that's the livestock based part of the system, which is basically 110, 120 cows. I can't remember how many. It's probably like asking a Laplander how many reindeer they've got. But um, they, I started mob grazing. Well, it's when I've I've seen some mob grazing systems, which really are mob grazing systems. I don't know what the definition of mob grazing, but certainly um, I move my cattle every day. Um, I carve in the spring from April, March to March, March and April, and um, I finish all the cattle on the farm as well. So daily moves nearly for all the cattle now. I'm just trying to reduce the number of mobs on the farm. So the, the cattle are finished roughly at 20 months old. I don't want to take them through a second winter. Okay. And... You're just cattle only, is that right, Doug? You don't you don't have sheep. I don't have sheep. Uh, we live next door to twenty thousand people. We're on the periphery of a town, and I reckon we would have a horrendous problem with dogs on the farm and dog walkers and um, fences being cut and so on. It's bad enough with cattle, but sheep would just be tip me over the edge. Yeah. Okay. And are you on? because obviously you've got some arable within that system as well are the stock just on the cattle just on permanent pasture system or are no, they involved in they come I, into the arable yeah they come into the arable i grow about 80 80 acres of arable crops um, on a rotation so i have five in the past i've had five years of grass and then a couple of years of cereals but those cereals are always under sown so i have feed over the winter i think it's ridiculous having an empty field a bare field over the winter so they're always under sown with something um for a bit of a bite after harvest but i wanted to reduce that i i really wanted to kick the the arable side out of the window because i think the future is so much easier having one system um on the organics and that will be cattle and having perennial plants in it as a basis to everything um yeah okay so and there is a question just popped in is um where are we? How many acres are your cattle on? There are 160 hectares. Hectares, yeah. It's quite a very extensive, um, very extensive. But um, great. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, I can see that Nikki and James <laughs> are struggling with their broadband and quite confusingly as well, because I gave you a link <laughs> to, to get in. You're actually showing Nikki as Emily Grant, <laughs> which is slightly confusing, but we know that you're Nikki. <laughs> Nikki, do you still need just a couple of minutes just to get set up or are you ready to, to rock and roll? Yeah, I can I can do a quick intro. I've had to switch onto my phone yeah. because my yeah. laptop's really struggling. So um, I'm just going to shut that down. Are you just wanting us to introduce who we are? Sorry. Please. We... Yes. Yes. You've missed it. You've missed it. So just introduce who you are. Yeah. Where you are and the, the kind of stock system that you're running. OK, so um, we're Nikki and James Yoxall. We're based at Howe Mill, which is in Aberdeenshire, North East Scotland. Um, we run a very small system. So we've been doing this for just over a year. Um, we just have nine cattle at the moment, um, mostly Shetlands, also a couple of white Galloways. Um, and we set up a grazier business. So we own just 18 acres, but we graze currently um, around 100 acres across various different um, licenses and arrangements with landowners, um, mostly doing um Kind of we would think of it as beyond conservation grazing i suppose so it's working with landowners who are looking for regenerative or restorative grazing um to address some of the challenges they might be having around like lack of habitat and things um so they're wanting more diverse habitats um it's just site and owner dependent yeah so it totally depends on the site and the owner um so we use the we mob to do that um and yeah it just depends on where we are as to what our our system and our approach is and there are 
they're mixed um, stock classes, so they're all in together at the moment. Yeah. Okay. And so you you will also be taking you take calves all the way through to finish. Yeah, yeah. we we have a mix. Um, so our white Galloways, we um, we've been buying in um, as yearlings, um, and wean calves, and the Shetlands are what we're going to be breeding from. So a bit of a mix, and just working out what works best for us here, as I said, because we're quite new to this. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, I think really as well, what, what, what I want to touch on next is, is um, I suppose, trying to get to grips with um, your grazing management system, because I think there are so many, um, I was, you know, was suggesting other, what is mob grazing? I mean, there's, there's so much to it. And I think there are so many um, different, slightly different systems, and everybody has slightly different aims and objectives about what they're trying to achieve with their grazing system. So, I'll go around again, same order, but I just I just want you to just kind of summarize, you know, it's, it's, this is kind of like the why are you doing it? So what are you really trying to achieve? What are the key priorities that you're trying to achieve in this system? Because I think that also has a big impact on how you then manage. So I think if we can just clarify what you want to achieve out of this kind of more grazing system. So Andrea and Charlie. Well, I'm just a general farm worker, so. Andrea should answer that one. Um, no, I think I think for us, uh, we we really wanted to get the most out of the farm that we already had, rather than necessarily getting bigger. And that was the driver to get into paddock grazing or rotational grazing, and dividing the place up, grazing it in small areas at a time. Now that wasn't specifically a move into mob grazing. That's something that's come a little bit later. Um, but the but the huge driver for going into the, that all the subdivision and the paddocks was to improve the output and basically have more kilos of output to spread the fixed costs over uh, because we weren't in a sustainable position after 2012 and 13. Um, we were relatively low cost if you looked at it in variable cost terms, but not when you started to bring in fixed costs because it just wasn't enough output. So that was the first driver. The driver though, over the last two or three years for getting into mob grazing has been uh, well, a fascination with it and with how it can fit into the environmental picture. And I don't mean just from a wildlife point of view into the big picture on climate change, um, how it might make our farm more resilient. The 2018 dr uh, drought really concentrated our minds and we'd been thinking about doing this and talking about it, not actually doing it. And then we got 2018 drought and we were you know, we grew less than 60% of that average dry matter that year than we normally do. And we thought, well, look, let's give it a go. Um, because it felt like, from what we were hearing from other people that were doing things, that that might have been a way of building in some resilience into our system there. Um, so that was probably what kicked us over the over the line. But but really, it was the that, to coin a phrase, but the holistic thing, thinking of it as a whole and how it fits into the environmental picture and the whole thing, but it's got to pay as well. And so that's been the big thing for us is, is comparing mob grazing with, if you like, rotational grazing or paddock grazing, whatever you want to call it. Short, tall grass grazing versus short grass grazing. Yeah. And how are you feeling about that, Charlie? Do you think, you know, because I think there's a there's quite often an assumption that um, mob grazing or tall grass grazing, however you want to describe it, is... is um, possibly utilizing or making use of slightly lower quality pasture than you do on your more intensive rotational system. Um, so, you know, that then leads people to the assumption that that you're you're taking a hit on performance or um, total farm productivity. I realize you're only a couple of years in, but how are you feeling about it? Uh, so far, very positive. Um, output last year, which is only year we've got the full data on was just as good off a similar uh, off a similar acreage as it had been previously i mean it was better than 2018 obviously but that was such a difficult year but it was better it was as good as the previous years you know prior to that so that was quite promising um you know calf growth rates were as good uh, the same number of stock well it was the same stocking rate per acre so that was all positive this year um, we'll know better in, a, in two or three weeks' time when we've weaned calves and got a, got weights back and what have you. But yeah. uh, it certainly feels like it's in the right place this year. Um, 
we have noticed that the, the cattle appear to be very settled on on the system. They they obviously like the taller grass. They like the extra dead material they're getting in it. Um, the, the cows definitely are feeling very happy with the system. Mm. It, yeah, and mm. I think it's certainly been easier to manage at this time of the year um, when cattle are often feeling like they haven't got full bellies. I think with a bit extra of that roughage stuff in there, that's helping. I think at other times of the year when we're looking for um, performance out of the calves, well, I mean, you're always looking for performance out of the calves, but you know, there's this perception as you, you identify that you look at what you're letting them into and you go, on average, that's probably not going to analyse terribly high energy, but it's what they choose to eat that is important, not not what the whole is, because the whole isn't going to get eaten in general. Yeah. Okay, great. We'll, we'll come on to that because we'll, we'll have a chat about what kind of covers you're going into and residuals and management. So I just want to move on to Doug. And Doug, did you... you kind of had a road to Damascus, Damascus moment, did you, and um, moving towards mob grazing? Because you were lucky enough to head across the water, weren't you, and have a look at what was going uh, on. I was very, in the state. I was very, very fortunate because I, um, looking at going around Gabe Brown's place, a lot of ranches in North Dakota and Joel Salatin, and and it was, it was a, a real eye-opener. And there, they're miles ahead. I felt very small because what they were doing, it just seemed to make total sense. And it ticked every single box was ticked. I know it's the States and there's dry climates and the Midwest and things like that, but a lot of the stuff could be taken across the UK. It's the same thing. It's, it's improve, making, it's just like Charlie was saying, it's making your soils more resilient at the end of the day, um, um, drought proofing and um, water infiltration rates. And, mm -hmm. and, and it all at the end of the day comes comes down to the soil and but I, and I've seen them on tall grass here I don't have much in the way of tall grass I haven't um, this year I've got plenty of grass but not tall grass going gone to head but I've seen cattle beasts uh, certainly Aberdeen Angus cattle beasts being a lot happier on rough grazing than on um, perennial ryegrass beautiful perennial ryegrass with with clover because it goes straight straight through them they're not they're not built, these native cattle are not built for that sort of grass, really. Um, okay, uh, an elite dairy cow, maybe, but certainly not our native breeds because it goes straight through them and they're not satisfied because they don't have a full belly. And that's just my take on it. I'm completely, completely wrong, but um, I have learned more in the last couple of years and probably with cattle than I have the rest of my life put together. It's, it's, it's a game of observation more than anything else. Okay, a lot of yeah. reading, but a game of observation, yeah. Yeah. And um, what key things are you trying to achieve from adopting this system? The horrendous cost I was I was um, forking out for wintering cattle inside. Um, yeah. Also, I had a lot of I had a large area of nearly over half my grassland area was 30, 40 year old per, per, permanent grass. And the cost of ploughing that up and reseeding, I just didn't sit well because the aggregate stability there, the soils were well structured. Okay, there might have been a bit of surface compaction because of set stocking regimes that I used in the past, but <coughs> given it, I was I'm determined that mob grazing or or and daily moves and long rest periods will sort that grass out naturally. Okay, it might need a bit of stitching in of some chicory or or um, annuals into that grass, and that's easily easily enough done with machinery available nowadays. Luckily, I've got a direct drill. Um, but um, those are the two. The, yeah, the, the the two big reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and we've got the highest Great. price in the world. Scotland's got one of the second highest <laughs> price in the world. If we can't make it work here, where the hell in the world can they make it work? Yeah, uh, that's just my personal yeah. take. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and and you're right. I mean, in in pretty well all suckler cow systems, it's it's the wintering cost that that is is pretty major in in systems. But Great, and we'll we'll touch yeah. on. So I very, say that again, Doug. I've got a very I've got a very low rainfall, and there's notice there's a whole load of people from the yeah. west coast that have three, four, five times the rainfall I have, and it's trickier. It'll be trickier there. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, we'll we'll try and cover off some of these issues as we go through the questions, because that's uh, whatever your grazing system is when you're, you know, when you're putting up fences and changing paddock size, it's a it's a pretty regular question is how do you manage wet? And we'll also somebody remind me as we go through, I think, because we're starting to touch on things like um, pasture species. So we'll we'll come through to that as well. So um, Nikki and James. Yeah. So. Obviously, I think it's but your, your aims and objectives are possibly slightly different because you're also grazing on behalf of other people. But do you want to just to explain, yeah, why why are you mob grazing and what what are you trying to achieve? What are your key objectives? Um, I think to start off with, it was to try and get as much as we possibly could out of the small acreage that we initially began with. Um, so you know, trying to create leave as much grass behind so that there was plenty to come back to. So that was the primary thing. Um, we started to become more interested in sort of regenerative agriculture principles and um, exploring the idea of year round ground cover and maintaining longer covers so that you can protect the soil. Um, we live just above uh, the river on quite a hill. So we were thinking we were quite conscious about um, keeping soil where it was rather than letting, the, you know, rather than there being any runoff. Um, and the more that we explored um, the benefits of mob grazing we could see that there were clear biodiversity benefits um, and just seeing the diversity of the plants that are coming through in the sward. Yeah, um, yeah maintaining habitat was a big thing because when we took our place on there, there was a lot of wildlife here and there was a lot of cover um, so it was kind of yeah maintaining that whilst being able to produce a product. Great, perfect. Okay, what I really want to touch on now is probably, you know, is what all the, the questions are starting to come through about as well. It's just really about the the how, the, the nuts and bolts of um, how adopting a mob grazing kind of system can help you achieve those objectives. Um, and I think probably, yeah, so, case of which part you tackle first because there's quite a few things within it but probably I think what would be easiest to tackle first is and um, we'll just rather than ask you individually I'll, I'll kind of break it down into key areas of um, residuals well a what what kind of height of grass if if you're measuring what kind of height are you going into b what kind of residual are you leaving b obviously the c sorry there's obviously some residue within that because we've had a little bit of talk about trampling and then also the rest period so you know there's a lot to cover in there but I think let's just start by talking about what kind of covers you're going into are you how how are you planning this are you going in at a certain stage of productivity on the grass plant or a specific um, uh, kilos of dry matter per hectare or are you just completely you know using using eye and just going for it so whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'm happy. And Nikki's just unmuted. We could go first just because for us it's yeah. going to be really different to the other guys. So we we don't measure swords height. We don't have a plate meter. Sword stick wouldn't reflect what we're grazing because some of it is five foot high, coxfoot and um and tufted hair grass. So it just is kind of outside the usual uh, measurement scales. Um, we also integrate mob grazing into agroforestry as much as possible. So we can't take into account browse um, by using a sword stick. So for us, it's all about eye. And it really also depends on, um, on the area that we're grazing. We were grazing um, what had been kind of permanent pasture at Lone Head this year. Um, we were mob grazing there and that was kind of more traditional I suppose in terms of um, perennial ryegrass, clover and there was some other stuff coming through which we didn't know about until we were mob grazing and then seeing some of these more diverse plants coming through um, but again we weren't measuring uh, dry matter it was very much I um, I think James you're a little bit more specific than I am I'm very much just looking at it and working it out and thinking what impact have they had um, and you know what what are we trying to achieve here for this landowner? Um, yes, yeah, so we were counting leaves basically and um, discarding the original three leaf system and going for a four leaf system basically so that we've definitely got some brown uh, matter in there that is then going to be pushed into the ground to try and balance the fungal bacterial um relationship that you find um that is normally 
quite highly bacterial when we're talking about grazing systems. Um, so yeah, we definitely wanted to sort of get some more fungal um, into that. And that was pasture. that was particularly restorative action in a field that had been overgrazed year on year on year on year. So for us, going in there was very much about trying to put something back into the soil um, and trying to build in longer rest periods to allow the soil to kind of regroup after we'd been through with the cattle. So for us, it's very much about I we graze really tall covers. We're integrating trees as well, so it's quite complex. And I think the the learning point for us is that you just have to get started with it. And you'll make some mistakes and there'll be times when you're leaving them in too long and times when you're moving them out too quickly but the more you do it the more you get an eye for the different types of places that you're grazing and you can adapt accordingly but we were, yeah sorry we were <laughs> we were leaving behind that wasn't um take everything down to the ground that was we were definitely leaving quite a large residual um mm. ready yeah. to come back I again yeah. So do you have an aim for, for, are you, for example, a take 50, leave 50% or are you, how are you amending? Uh, I, su I suppose roughly, um, it does depend on the time of year a little bit and what the weather's been doing. Um, if it's particularly wet or um, sometimes it's harder to do that when it's particularly wet. Um, uh, yeah, and when it's, yeah, about 50-50. Great, perfect. Okay, um, Andrea and Charlie, what uh, what covers are you going into? How are you making that decision when to go in? Uh, winging it. Uh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Always winging it. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's not quite true. We we went into um, as I said, uh, rotational grazing, paddock grazing in a big way in twenty back end of twenty thirteen, beginning of twenty fourteen. And I quite like numbers and I like the crutch that that gives. And so we started measuring, not, not very particularly at the time. Uh, the most measuring I did, I found, was after I bought a plate meter. Uh, not because specifically I've got a plate meter, more because I spent 450 quid on it and Andrea made me go and measure the grass because I spent that much money on a toy. But no, so I did do a lot of numbers and so for... 14 through to 2014 through to about 2018, it was very much a case going into something like two and a half thousand, 2,700 um, kilograms of dry matter per hectare, maybe 3,000 um, for up to 3,000 for the cattle, and trying to leave in general 1,500 behind, um, possibly certain times of the year taking it down to 1,200. Uh, as we've gone into mob grazing, we're going into obviously much longer covers, but basically feels to me like we're putting in them into a silage field. Um, that's how it feels at the beginning. Um, that's probably a little bit extreme, but that is where we're at. Now, I can measure that with the plate meter. As Nikki's already alluded to, the pasture seat's not terribly accurate. The plate meter is probably not terribly accurate to be fair at that. But, you know, a lot of what we're going into is measuring 4,000 plus with those tools. Um, so it's off the scale somewhat um, and therefore isn't hugely accurate in management but when we sort of compare it with grazing days and comparing animal performance um, you can get a bit of a handle on how it is how it is working in those se that sense so we're going into long covers uh, it's based much more on uh, when it fits back into the rotation and long rest periods there's quite a bit of ground in stewardship here that is seasonally unavailable so there's ground we're going back into now that may not have been grazed it probably should have been grazed in August, September, but there's a bit of it at the moment that didn't get grazed then. Um, it hasn't, which means it hasn't been grazed since about mid-May. Um, now that's quite extreme. That's some some steep rough banks and things. Um, so it's a really long rest period, obviously, and obviously those covers are just you know really tall, jungly stuff. But um, that's fine. Uh, but for improved pasture, yeah, I'd say in general a lot of it is is measuring in the in high 3000s through early 4000s up to four and a half thousand but it's possibly a little bit more there than that maybe some after and are you yeah are you go, kind of going for grace 50 leave 50 or are you taking it down a little bit more than that what's what's your aim depends uh, to be honest that depends a lot on the time of year and on the uh 
on, on pasture growth at the time or pasture availability at the time. So we're set up to have a longer rotation than we would have done under short grass grazing, if you like. So where we've been 24 days in the past, we, we think of it in terms of 36 days. I'm not going to pretend it's as exact as that. Uh, through the earlier part of the season, through May, June, when things are really humming. Uh, and then we extend that as other ground comes back into being available, silage aftermaths and stewardship ground comes back into being available. Um, in terms of what do we leave behind, you know, in the, in the spring of the year and, and early summer, it's really about trying to get the most out of animal performance. So we're just moving on when they, when they pick the best out. And if they're leaving quite a lot behind, I'm quite happy with that. We're coming back around. It was, you know, it was glorious watching it. You know, after I took the cows out the first year we did it, you just think, oh my goodness, it looks like they've trashed the silage field. Uh, a week later, you know, it was a nice growthy time. A week later, you can see all this lovely greenery coming up through what's been trampled. Uh, two weeks later, it looks fantastic. Three weeks later, even better. But, you know, four or five weeks later, excellent, you know, ready to go back in at that time. So it does vary. This time of year, if conditions are allowing it, we're probably going to take a bit more. Um, you know, leave a bit less. And to be honest, you know, we've also at times been back around with, we'll do leader follower perhaps, um, but certainly dry cows or ewes in mid pregnancy might actually clean up quite a bit of the material there uh, and leave, not leave a huge cover through the winter at all, um, but enough to get yeah. us going in the spring. Because you, you should make it clear, yeah. because we're organic, we swap over. So um, it's cattle one year, sheep the next year. So one year it's tall grass and the next year it's short grass so it, it's it's pretty complicated but quite straightforward yeah. really. <laughs> great thank you um doug are you measuring how are you taking decisions for for when you're going in to graze oh you need to unmute doug it's a um, hi. It's a baptism of fire, really. Four years ago, I just chucked them into the field for the summer and just let them get on with it. Groups all around the place, and and um, but I'm a bit like Charlie now. The figures are a bit more important. This is a lot. Very fortunate to borrow Johnny Balfour's uh, plate meter a couple of weeks ago because I wanted to assess how much grass I had going into the winter. So. I think I, I said, I think I, my thing, a video, I said 400,000, but I probably got 500, half a million of kilos of uh, available dry matter in total. And I'm really chuffed to bits with that because last year it was a total opposite. I think I did everything wrong last year. I started off with 30 day rest periods, 15 to 30 day rest periods, and the rest periods actually went down. But every year is different. So you've got, I think this year we've been exceptionally lucky with the weather, with the grass growth. Um, I try to graze uh, the, the, the cows. I probably take the grass down a bit more, slightly more non-selective grazing, but the fattening stock, stock, they just skim the surface the whole time. They're probably taking no more than the third to get the best all the way through. And there's obviously a big, there's a big sort of dilemma. Do we take, if the cows, for example, took everything down to the deck, especially earlier on, then you can, you'll be extending your, naturally you'll be extending your rest periods and it comes to the situation, what's more important, the rest periods or the leaf left over? And I'm still quite a, uh, an advocate of not taking more than half or a third because then the roots do stop growing for a while and, and that makes eminent sense. I don't, and, but there's no prescribed, I've, it's very difficult to, I'm only just starting, so I, I, I don't have a blueprint for it at all. Um, and, but some of my covers, this now at present, I've got over five, like Charlie, over 5,000 kilos of dry matter in the field, going down to probably two and a half, but they're, this, they're on the last graze round the farm now this winter. And, um, I'll probably take it right down to 1500 kilos a hectare of dry matter. I don't particularly want to see bare soil over the winter. That's the only thing I, I yeah. uh, because the effects of rainfall are horrendous on soils. Great, brilliant. Thanks, Doug. Um, I'm, yeah, just you having talked about, yeah, Clem, Clem's just appeared again in, in screen. Clem, are, are we, do we want to just start to move on 
towards the questions I think we'll I think, we can probably yeah, tie in with still some of the things we want to discuss anyway as we go yeah, through we've so. got a lot of questions come in on many different <laughs> topics so I'm just thinking we need to get started with those and uh, I'm just yeah. also really aware that um, we had a couple of questions sent in by email in advance of the event so I actually wanted to just come to those first because they're kind of related um, and they also cover some other things that have come up particularly around how can this work in a wet uh, wet west coast or any kind of wetter situation might be useful if you can share what your rainfall is all of the farmers but also just uh, generally there's quite a few questions both around it concern about poaching um, and particularly wet at fields can can they be grazed and also around size um, of paddocks and it, do people have enough land uh, enough acreage to actually mob graze so I mean I don't know if we can if we want to do those separately or or together because that was some of the questions that came through were both related to yeah that. well I would say cover off the wet thing first of all <laughs> the wet thing <laughs> it's about dealing with with wet conditions because it might it might actually just draw us a little bit more than towards things like paddock size and how long you need to you know you want to spend in paddock so um who wants to go dealing with wet weather? Go, Charlie. I'll well, give it a try, but I, I appreciate we're sitting in a position of strength being on 30 inch rainfall and very free draining soils. But from the, the people that I, you know, that I've been in groups with and that are working on the wet soils, and they can perhaps add to this, but I perceive that it's, it's about flexibility, it's about being prepared to move more quickly. Um, it's about if you can have some form of a runoff block, whether that be a bit of a bit of hill ground or a, it could be a shed even, you know, um, or a forage crop, which obviously is also going to potentially be wet. But um, I think there are ways to do it that people, you know, and as I say, I'm not particularly qualified to do it, but I think there's definitely ways to mitigate it. Um, however, you know, with the best well in the world, it's probably not going to be as easy as it is on, on this farm here. Yeah, Nikki, do you want to go? Yeah, I was just thinking about um, how, I mean, we we ha we purposefully chose a small um, breed of cattle because we knew that some of our boggy ground just wouldn't be able to hold up a, a heavier animal. Um, so with the Shetlands, that works really well. Um, we have found that having those longer residuals, so leaving taller grass, it does hold the animals up some. Um, so even uh, exactly as Charlie said, you know, moving them a bit quicker, so we might have set up a paddock for 24 hours, get horrendous weather, um, move them after 12. But you know that having that kind of armour on the ground does just hold them up to some extent. Um, so and I know that, you know, having seen other other folk who've been doing this for a bit longer, um, Jane, who's up in Orkney, you know, obviously much wetter than here, is seeing some fantastic results around um, water infiltration having mob grazed up there for three years um, with this, you know, using this approach. And so I think um, it, it does make a difference. The more you, the longer you do it, the better it gets is what I'm seeing from other places. And, and we've definitely seen that to some extent here as well. And also to be uh, a little less scared of poaching because um, we have poached some areas and they have come back stronger when we have given them that rest so yeah as long as you build the rest in afterwards then then you know you can you can see that recovery and I think we get really worried about mud um because if in a set stock system if you have poached areas they don't get the rest so they just stay trashed whereas as long as you take the animals off and you give that time um even in the middle of winter you will start to see it recover Doug do you want to say anything about managing yeah, wet conditions yeah my my observations from here and a few other farms I've seen, um, if they're on if they're on an area of land for half a day for a day, it's not an issue as long as that rest period is afterwards. You can use it to your advantage. You can if you really badly poach. If it looks like it's going to be heavy rain and you want to leave your cattle on for a bit longer to poach it a lot, then ideal opportunity of sprinkling some more grass seed on. Um, to regenerate it. And the other thing I wanted to say was the below ground root growth mirrors pretty much above ground um, biomass. And, and I think um, some of these older species of grass, the Coxfoot, the Timothys, some of the fescues, um, getting a bit more diversity into sward, even using um, 
probably red clovers or um, or brassicas with their deep tap roots. And dare I say it, um, Dockens, then you want the ability to have those roots going deep means that that will help with the infiltration. Also, it's very tempting sometimes to, if you muck up an area of land, is to take a, a disc or cultivate it or plow it or whatever it is, but I wouldn't even touch that with a barge pole because it will come back. The soil will restore. Nature doesn't like a bare surface. It will congregate that land very quickly with other plants, even weed species, and you could use them to your advantage as well. Just, just that's just my observations that I've seen in the last few years or so. Great, perfect. Okay, so I think this also sort of ties in a little bit then to paddock size, um, and then which also starts to drift in a little bit to to kind of stocking density. But what what are each of you are you are you aiming for daily shifts or three day shifts or how are you deciding paddock size? And also, can you just add in there just what kind of mob size you're dealing with? You know, are you are you have pretty large mobs going through, and is there anything that's restricting that mob size um, for you, or are you just like just bundle everything together? It'll be cool. Whoever wants to go first. Ah, uh, we'll we'll give it a go if you like. Um, we run all the cows and heifers that are going to the bull and the cubs of those cows as a wanna um, pretty much all year round well all year round except for calving when they're in a field where they're calving and they go out through the gate as they carve um, well you know within 24 hours so we run all 110 as one mob um, three bull mob and we find that has developed the grazing pressure on here that we well, probably not as much as we're looking for, but certainly it's helped us be um, not have to do quite as much subdivision. So the farm is broadly divided into seven acre, or seven and a half to eight acre paddocks, um, about three hectares. And uh, we, we graze through those uh, often on a two day shift, um, but we also at times split those in half and we think we do a better job when we split them in half um, with an electric wire. It just depends, uh, well, it depends a little bit on motivation, but it depends also on uh, on the time of year and, and the sort of immediate, immediate objectives. I think we'd be better on, on daily shifts. I think we'd get more of a, a more even trample um, as, and a more even manuring, um, but the two day has fitted quite nicely with the the infrastructure that was already in for the rotational paddock grazing uh, and with the mob size and there was a there was a, a big incentive to get that mob size up um, in order to make that a little bit easier to manage as well and just to yeah. say the cattle, we keep them behind one wire so yeah. the calves can duck the wire and um, for the grazing so even if you're putting pressure on the grazing the calves can still graze forwards mm. mm -hmm. yeah and you're not restricted in terms of that mob size by, for example, handling um, facilities. I, I realise it's not quite like having sheep where they're pretty regularly um, in handling facilities, but but that isn't a limitation at all, is it? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> the, the, I don't think, so there's 200 in the mob if we count calves and cows and bulling heifers or bald heifers, and I don't think they'd fit in our handling. So... Um, not all at once anyway it'd be easy enough to split the mob in half you know just let give them a run of two paddocks and pop the gate shut on them one day and then bring half in uh, we could do that the way that we go at the moment is that we'll we'll wean out in the paddock um in the next uh, probably this week or next probably next week actually now um we'll wean in the paddock and then the cow group will come in um for their PD and pregnancy diagnosis, that is, and their calf group will come in for their for their weighing and what have you. And any that have got in the wrong mob, you know, because inevitably there'll be some cows left in the calf mob. There might be the odd calf that's cut through into the cow mob. Uh, we'll get sorted out, and we just do it like that. So we're not handling the whole herd at once. And you know, if if we had to get an act, something ailing in or whatever, we can just cut a few out or whatever. So it's not too too big a deal, really. Great. Perfect. Okay, Doug, 
So summarize again, how are you, are you on daily shifts? How are you deciding paddock size and mob size? How are you working it? Um, I'm pretty religiously sticking to daily moves on the whole, except when I'm on holiday or certain days I, they maybe haven't eaten enough. There's a lot of it's between, it's adaptable. It's very, uh, there's no, there's definitely no strict way of saying I'm moving them every day or this paddock size is this amount because they could be going from an old permanent pasture field which is really rocky with very low grass growth and they could be at a couple of hectares there every day into a field which has been re-sown 10 years ago and it's got different grasses and there's a lot more grass there and they could only be on um, half a hectare on that so um, I'm adapting it i'm changing this set. that's the beauty of the system you can very i can very easily change the paddock size um as far as limitations on the system that i think i i spent a reasonable amount of upgrading the system but water is the critical one and if you're water moving a water trough every day and feeding a hundred and 20 cows and 120 calves every day, then they use quite a bit of water. So I've upgraded my water pipes um, to just do the cattle I've got. And I perhaps should have gone, because I'm certainly seeing more productivity of the, over the grass this year, but I'm not going to, not going to speak any more of that because maybe it might go down next year. It's, um, but I, I can see grass productivity going up over time yeah yeah okay um and mob size any kind of restrictions for you in terms of mob size who me yeah sorry doug yeah um um i reckon i could probably get i've Probably a hundred, two parts of the farm. One part is up high, higher, 650 feet, and the other part is sort of boys' land down at um, 80, 80 meters or so. And um, probably 150 cows I could probably go up to. Yeah, but in one mob. In one mob. But I could go up more because I could use, I uh, this now I'm using small drag troughs, which are easily pulled by hand to the next watering point, moving that every day. But I could, if it's a really hot summer, I could put these big, big troughs in, these big um, thousand litre or whatever it is troughs, and that would that would cope with it. Yeah. And are you just behind a single wire as well, Doug? Yes. Yeah, a single wire is fine. No problem. Absolutely no problem at all with a single wire. No, I've got no qualms about that and as long as it's the right height sort of 900 I don't know what Charlie does or or Nikki and James do but um, 900 millimeters 0.9 of a meter 0.95 of a meter or so yeah Nikki and James that's a good point to bring you guys in so obviously you you were again slightly different you were smaller mob but yeah how are you working your mob and working out your are you on daily shifts are you on three day because obviously you must be working a bit remotely as well from where you live too yeah to some extent most of the land that we graze at the moment is directly it's either ours or attached to ours so it's fairly easy but some of it you can't get to without walking so it's a bit of a trek to get up there but we generally work on daily moves and in the summer we might do twice a day um just because we, well, James would quite happily spend all of his time moving electric fence if he could, so to him it's completely free. Um, but yeah, so the only thing that's limiting us, is, well, there's two things. One, financially, we're at the very start of our journey, so buying stock is obviously quite a, um, an outlay for us. And the other thing is that our grazing agreements generally are on a short-term basis, uh, or quite informal. Um, so I, I suppose I'd want to just mention that because there are people who think that this maybe can't be done on a smaller scale or can't be done when you're trying to manage different grazing arrangements but you know you can make it work um, you just have to have really mobile infrastructure um, and exactly that thing around uh, so we, uh, there was a question about what kit we use we primarily use um, Kiwi Tech um, which is great because you can adjust where the um, it, because it's modular you know it's really flexible single wire um, when we do train our cattle to the to the wire so when we first when we first had them because we've had to you know bring all new animals in and um, we did use a double wire just to be really sure that they weren't going to go through it um, but 
yeah it's just about that flexibility and and um and and having kit that we can move around quite easily double wire for um the first couple of weeks while we've had calves um just to make sure that they know uh how it all works and also for a cheeky bull who knew how to slink underneath a single wire which was <laughs> quite impressive to watch actually um so yeah two wires in those scenarios but all the other time yeah single wire not a problem Great, perfect. Um, okay, I'm. I just wanted to jump in. Yeah, and on you go. Yeah. There's still loads of questions, but just to highlight something that's been put into the Q and A chat, uh, Philip Close, who's a member of the Mob Grazing Group, we should we should have had him on here as well. Um, he's uh, they're they're in in the southwest in Ayrshire, and they're on really wet wet ground high rainfall and there are other members of the group that have higher higher rainfall so it might be that we need to do uh, a separate session specifically on that um just to anyway it's just to highlight he's written some very useful information in in the box there um but where do you want to go next emily we've got uh we've kind of covered a little bit about fencing there's quite yeah. a on uh, there's a bit there's been a few questions around animal health and also animal behavior so there's one on uh, noticing any animal health benefits from mob grazing. And then also Richard Lockett was asking, what was he asking? I'm trying to find the question now. Richard's, um, Richard was covering off uh, stock. Yeah, where is Richard's now? Richard's here. Well, the, that's really yeah, strange. Was, okay, down <laughs> the other side. okay, well, yeah. should, we, should we drift towards then the, the animal health? Um, yeah benefits so and also there was because um, there was also a question around minerals and drenches and warmers so if we look a bit at exactly. animal health and, and that kind of thing yeah okay so um we'll probably go to nikki and james first so animal health oh charlie charlie's got his hand in the air charlie, Sorry, you, miss. are you bursting yeah on I you go i've been a bad boy i've answered a couple of the questions I've typed in an answer and it's gone into the answered part. So sorry about that. I didn't realize it was going to do that. And apologies. I just thought I'd try and cover off a few more questions while we're here. Great. Thanks. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Since you're unmuted, animal health benefits. And are you using minerals or do you feel the need for less minerals, more minerals? Uh, animal health benefits are. That would be a difficult shout to say there are definitely animal health benefits compared to previously on the paddock grade system. Um, possibly in terms of uh, what we talked about in terms of autumn gut fill, and as it were, with a bit more roughage in the diet. I think that's a good thing. As I think Doug pointed out, there's a lot of, a lot of that rich grass going straight in one end and straight out the other, about six feet, 12 feet out the other end as well. That can't be a good thing. Um, so in that sense, yeah, but I wouldn't make any other huge claims mineral wise we we know we're short of a lot of things uh that well not just me i mean the <laughs> cattle and um, the land so we do supplement we use boluses uh and we also offer free access mineral um, because we've got issues with a, a host of uh, trace elements well we have had issues in the past um and we've chased them away with the, the current strategy of boluses for the big four copper cobalt, selenium and iodine, all of which we're marginal to very low in. And the free access mineral is to cover off the, uh, the, the more minor ones that we also know there's a deficiency of uh, in soil and forage. Um, so that is our strategy. But I, I wouldn't at this stage make any plans for less or more minerals. I'm much more aware of providing the right minerals now than I was seven or eight years ago. So it's a little bit unfair comparison in that sense. Perfect. Nikki and James? Because uh, Nikki and James, you're also, you have a degree of tree browse within your grazing system as well, which may make a difference. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you might, I don't know how much everyone can see us, but when um, Doug mentioned docks, we did a little cheer as well, because they're really beneficial for animals, massively uh, nutrient rich. So um, yeah, we don't, provide any uh, minerals and we don't worm. Um, we've done fecal egg counts and they've come out really low. So we know that, um, that that's kind of fine. 
Um, yeah, so no, no additional inputs. Our cattle just get the really diverse pastures um, that we're really lucky to have around here. Um, kind of this marginal grazing, but it's just, you know, kind of rich and there's lots of different different plants in there providing lots of different um, nutritional needs and the trees make a massive difference and there's some really great resources online that give you you know you can look up a tree and it will tell you what the micro macronutrient value is for that tree um, so we can see also how the cattle change what they're browsing during the year so earlier in the year they go for particular species um, so like rowan in spring willow in summer um, and then they kind of move on to ashes and oaks at this time of year so it's really interesting to see that um, and I'm, I'm a great believer in, um, it might be a bit kind of hippie and woo, but that cattle kind of have this innate sense of choosing and selectively grazing what is going to, and browsing what's going to be beneficial to them. And I think one of the really good benefits of mob grazing is you're next to your cattle. If you're moving daily, you know, you're checking them daily and you're seeing them move, you're seeing the mobility, um, you're also seeing that dung and you, you can make adjustments to your paddock sizes and position based on whether they're um you know whether they're kind of loose or not um and you can get health indicators from that so it's quite easy to monitor far more quickly go on did you want to say something we have used apple cider vinegar in their water trough um in warm wet periods of the year um and it seems to work so um and they they do drink it. They, they seem to quite like it. Um, they like it more sometimes than others, which is interesting. Um, they'll, they'll go for big drinks sometimes with the apple cider vinegar, and sometimes they'll kind of leave it alone for a while. Um, and also in terms of welfare, I think, again, it's, it's observation. So we were making kind of triangular shaped paddocks um, to try and make the uh, twice daily moves easier. And actually there was a small amount of bullying because there was a kind of Pinch tight points. corner. Mm -hmm. So actually it's just, it's observing things like that and being adapt again, adaptive and changing when you see that, um, not putting water troughs in those corners and putting them along the sides of the fence where there's plenty of room, you know. Perfect, thank you. Um, Doug, animal health, benefits and or minerals oh you need to unmute doug yeah sorry um i'm fine. just following on from what james said the squarer the paddock the better i don't particularly want long thin paddocks because then there is number one the cattle run up and down a fence line all day long and there's a more poaching and if the squarer it is they're all in one group and there's not far to walk, go for the water but on the mineral front it's very difficult and very difficult because i don't want my my herd to fall down with phosphorus deficiency or or critical deficiency and it's an insurance policy i give free access minerals to my cattle all the time but I don't know, maybe I should go there back to rock, just rock salt. And I'm a great believer in rock salt, salt and it's not that expensive. Um, I, used to, I used to do religiously fecal egg counts every year. Um, I've given that up because for all the years since 2006, when I went organic, I never got any, any intestinal um, issues. And that was even when I was on set stocking. So theoretically moving them every day, having a slight, break in the disease cycle um hopefully um will get away will will increase the herd health but the big problem i have here and it's manifested itself with about 10 years ago was liver fluke and it's not a big problem but it's one that i dose for every year now um uh, because it's just there and and i know that the growth growth rates will be affected quite heavily if if and I've calculated the the loss in growth in daily live weight gain with cattle with liver fluke and ones not with liver fluke through the with the abattoir reports and um, no that's critical I do that but other than that a lot of it's observation I'm not clever enough to look at a cattle beast and say that's got this deficiency or that deficiency and you've got to rely on science I get my small bit of silage I make analysed. But um, and soil and 
and soil analyze quite frequently as well, because quite often the soil samples, samples mirror the silage samples results, which mirrors the blood sample results. And I, I found that on occasions as well, or, well, quite often with, there is a, a correlation there. Perfect, great. Um, just because you briefly touched on it in terms of growth rates, Doug, there is a question specifically for Doug from Giles. Um, what daily life weight gains are you getting with your fat nurse? Well, I'm just, I'm roughly on average, all my, the half, I keep half my heifers for replacements. So all my steers and the rest of the heifers I fatten. And the average is, I finish them at, on the region of nine, 20 months old, just over, just over 20 months old. And they come back at 315, 320 kilos dead weight. So two, so you so um so nearly double that for the live weight 350 Great. 320 kilos dead weight um i did an i i calculate i stopped creep feeding last year when i started mob grazing because i wasn't going to take a tractor in the field i don't want to take machinery in the field if i can help it um and there was a slight slight dip in growth rates and when they were, when I weighed them at, in the region of sort of 250 days, um, there was a dip of 0 0.05 daily live weight gain on the carbs. Of 0 0.05 on the carbs a day for not putting, not having a creep feed. So, and that made me think, well, why the hell did I bother for 20 years creep feeding them? Yeah, good point. <laughs> Great. And just to, because there was one, another, just briefly, Doug, you're calving in the spring. Is that right? Because there is a question about when you're calving. Yes, I am. I'm, and I haven't managed like Charlie and Nikki and James and Andrea um, to carve outside. Diet hard, um, have uh, bad habits take a long time to, to um, get rid of. Um, so they're carving and they're going straight straight out after carving. They're carving indoors and go straight out after carving from the beginning of the, the 5th to 10th of March and for, for over the period of most, most 70% carve within the first month. So um, majority of carve by the end of April. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I'm flicking through questions. Clem, have you got another... Just, um, are you flicking as well? I am. I'm just trying to figure out how to group them, but um, I, there's yeah. there's been a, a couple about sheep in the system. Yeah. Uh, and just I, I know you answered one of those, Charlie, but maybe you want to expand upon the sheep in your system because we're not we're not going to focus on sheep here, but it'd be worth touching on. And then maybe also answer Poppy Freighter's question: Did you find it challenging challenging to build pasture covers this summer? Maybe you could address both of those in a one. -er. Sure, yes. Uh, well, Poppy's question first, yes. Uh, it was very dry here. Well, I think it was dry in a lot of places through April and May, wasn't it? Which was lovely for lambing and calving. It was difficult to build covers. And in truth, it was probably not until ground started coming back into the grazing platform from silage and from stewardship until we were grazing the kind of covers that we imagine we should be grazing in this system, if you see what I mean. The kind of covers that we had last year, even. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, because we, were, we weren't chasing the grass, we weren't short of the grass, but in terms of building cover, it does take a lot of discipline um, to allow it to build. And discipline is not something I've been blessed with. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm married to Andrea, so that, that was good. So yes, that has been difficult. Um, on the sheep side, I, I see a few sheep questions. And um, the truth is, we are not really setting out to do mob grazing with sheep. Um, we, we graze half the farm, I think Andrew said earlier, half the farm with cattle, or half the grazing platform with cattle one year and half with sheep and swap that the following year. That's partly for internal parasite control, but also to share the mob grazing love around over the, over the pastures. Um, but there are practicalities that I 
I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing somebody doing it really effectively. And I think some people do do. Nobody I've yet met personally, but I've seen one or two YouTube things. The issues we would have in this climate, I believe, um, would be scalded in lambs, just with lots of long grass and, you know, in a wetter time or even a normal time, and, and simply keeping vegetation off the off the wires. You know, trying to keep stock in if you've got these sorts of covers is quite difficult. So we do do a little bit of it um, by, I won't say by accident, but sometimes your big mob of dry ewes and things um, post weaning, we can use them in a, in a much more of a mob grazing type role. There's a window for as I consider in August and September, but other than that, we're not particularly setting out to do it with sheep. And we don't, because I think some of the other questions relating to, do we follow the cattle with sheep? And it is like, well, yes, we do, but only annually. Not They're not in the next week, the next day, or even the next rotation. But I know that there are people that are doing that. My concern would be that sheep are very able to be very selective grazers and might be hitting those palatable grasses and, and herbs and such like uh, harder than we would wish. So that's partly why we don't do it too. Perfect. I'm wondering if we could answer the question, what advice would you give an arable farmer looking to bring grazing cattle into the rotation? And I might actually put that to Johnny, put that Johnny's way, just because I know you're uh, doing that to, to give you a little angle in. <laughs> okay. Um, well, how would you bring uh, cattle into an arable rotation? Uh, grow them a crop, fence off, fence off the field and mob graze it. Um, uh, not quite sure what else to say. We've grown multi-species cover crops on um, many of our fields. Uh, we've got all of our guys at the moment all building fences and we're trying to get more cattle on more acres and more years. Just do it. Great, great. Over to you, Emily. Okay. Go, go, go yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, this, where has it gone now? I've lost it. Um, can I just, somebody must have answered it. Yeah, when you go. <laughs> can I just chip in on that the, the arable farmer thing? I was, I was going to say, perhaps in the first instance, if you can convince somebody else to bring cattle in and give it a go. I don't know, it might not work for everybody, but if you can find somebody else bringing their cattle in, obviously capital wise and, and handling and what have you wise, and just see if that is helping. Because I, I perceive that there's a lot more relationships that could develop, but you've got to be careful to say that, uh, <laughs> between arable farmers and livestock farmers. But I think there's a huge opportunity, both for, for, for mixed farms to get, it. but if we're not mixed farms, which many of us aren't nowadays, um, to link up with an arable farm in our case, or um, you know, with the stock farming, I think it's Gordon, isn't it? Asking the question, and that might be a nice first step that isn't quite as heavily committing. You can ask Nikki and James; they can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, find your local graziers and see if they can come and uh, come and set up with their cattle. Um, I'm like, also wondering... great. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go on, Doug. So I think, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity for our rural farmers to have livestock back in their rotation. There's enormous amount. There's, and for example, down the southeast of England, they have huge black grass problems. And really, the nearly natural way of getting rid of black grass chemicals have found to be to 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 to, to cure everything as far as black grass because it's they've always got to keep on using them. But having a break in the rotation for three or four years and and getting some livestock farmers in. Also, even in Scotland or the north of England, there's a huge opportunity for maybe putting um, a winter cover crop in and sowing and um, under under sowing barley or wheat crops with um, clovers or 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 if there's enough time after harvest to direct drill um, some brassicas and some winter cover crops. Um, and I've seen myself getting up to fifty on my arable side of the equation direct drilling a cover crop straight after harvest in the middle of September and getting um, 30, 30 tons of dry matter, 30 tons of fresh weight, I think it was 12 tons of dry matter a hectare 
um, with no fertilizer. That fer that crop grew on the on the legacy effects of the fertilizers that were, were used on the um, on the arable crops or that was on the in the ground. So. Um, and it's much better grazing a cover crop than um, letting it go to rank and not being grazed. So, yeah. So there's a couple of questions. This is sparking a couple of questions in the chat about um, the electric fencing again. So um, there's. So I think this is Joe who originally asked about putting stock onto our arable system. Is that how much would you trust an electric fence to fence an arable field? My greatest fear is escaping cattle. So, guys, any comments? I suppose it might be worth just touching on training cattle as well. Or obviously, you know, get some store cattle for some, somebody who's already mob grazing. No, I, can I just say, my son's just started yeah. up, very, very luckily, started up an enterprise with another farmer and he's doing the cattle work for him. Um, cattle, I, from what I've seen, you can train them in a day pretty much a couple of days at the most it's very easy and I haven't had one breakout this year or last year no I had two two breakouts because the fences weren't the electrics wasn't on for a couple of days in and that's grazing um 350 cattle for two years and two breakouts so um I would hate to say I would hate to say that one wire would keep them off a motorway um, and I never, but um, electric fences, it depends how many wires you use as well. I think the thing yeah. is not to skimp on your energizer, like get spend some decent money on an energizer and get like, we've got double earthing rods, uh, lots massive, of yeah, lots yeah, of earth, earth, like good earth, spend a bit of money on a decent energizer. Um, and if you've got to walk really far, get remote control on. It really helps, <laughs> saves saves the legs a bit. Um, but yeah, just spend a bit of money on that and make sure that your batteries are working. We use solar, um, not the one like not the small inbuilt solar ones, but we've got some big solar panels which work fine all the way through the winter up here. So yeah, just spend a bit of money on that part of the kit, and um, and you should be fine. Yeah, Andrea, Charlie, yeah, I think we, I think uh, we can you, you're on mains. We are on mains, yeah, and likewise what Nikki's just said, you know, yes, get a good unit, but I think Dan just said as well, lots of good earths. We've got 13 two-metre earth rods in for our, for our system because that's what it needs uh, in a damp wood. And we had a great unit for a long time. But what the, th the point I was going to make was that all of the breakouts we have had have not been... I can't really attribute them to the electric fence failing. I can attribute them to human failing, usually my own. You know, oh, I'll be all right. I know that bit's not on, but it will be fine for the weekend, Six Nations weekend, break out, they're on the neighbours, yeah, you know, sort of thing. But, you know, it's nearly always a human failing that causes it. There's, there's been the odd branch come down on a fence. That's where, you know, you could argue, yeah, that is force of nature and what have you. But, you know, even there, that's still up to me to manage that situation. And you've got a bit of chance to catch up with that because they do have quite a bit of respect for the fence if you've got a decent shock in it most of the time. It takes them a wee while to notice. Yeah, but if, if we had a time again and we had a blank canvas for this farm, I would have done a lot less permanent fencing. I'd have the perimeter permanently fenced and I would have lay, a laneway in an X shape through the farm uh, permanently fenced everything else would be electric because it gives you maximum flexibility. Obviously that's not entirely practical here. There's woods, there's walls, there's all sorts of landscape features, but that would be the sort of ideal. I'm super aware of time. It's flown in. We're, we're a couple of minutes off our finishing time and we've got so many more things we could discuss, but um, hopefully this just gives a uh, validation to the fact we have to have more of these and with other farmers from the group as well. Um, I, was, I was wondering if, we could finish off with with everyone each of each of you sharing just a top tip for getting started something that really helped you um when you were getting started is, is have you got any words of wisdom to share to to close up can i go can <laughs> no, i go <laughs> always the first always well, sorry 
<laughs> no, the thing, the thing that really kicked us over the line, and, and again, it's not specific to mob grazing, but to doing subdivision and getting into rotational or paddock grazing. I was at a meeting and it was Murray Roloff, New Zealand, there, and he said, he'd, he'd given us chapter and verse about how to utilize grass and what have you and how to get the most out of it. But he said, if all you do is go home from this meeting and put two groups, put two fields worth of stock into one field and leave the other field for a day or two or a few days, depending on the time of year, uh, and then just rock them between the two fields, you will have taken a big step forward and you'll start to see and believe in, in what you're doing. And I, I, that was just such a huge moment for me um, that got us over the line and into giving it a go, making it happen instead of dreaming up reasons why it couldn't happen here. Shall we come in no, next? No. Oh, sorry. Oh. Go on, go, Doug. Go on, Doug. You go. Sorry. You go. You go. I think for us, particularly being new to this, it's connecting with people. Like being part of the, the mob grazing field lab has been phenomenal and the amount of support and guidance. But um, if you're not um, in a particularly, you know, a focused mob grazing WhatsApp group, for example, then just make connections with people who are doing it so that you can ask questions, you can go and visit them. I think connecting with other people who are doing it just gives you that confidence and that ability to ask what you might think are stupid questions of people. And, you know, people are always happy to answer them. Um, and I think, um, yeah, Twitter has been phenomenal for that. Um, so yeah, just connect with people who are doing it and ask the stupid questions because everyone has been there and they're always keen to answer them. Yes, I, my experience, I wish I'd done it 20 years ago. I, there's no, there's, I can't see any downside. There's nothing more satisfying than moving every day. You want to be out there moving them the whole time and forget everything else on the farm. Um, there's nothing more satisfying than moving a bunch of cattle that are roaring at you because they know they see you and they want to be moved. Um, going into the next door paddock, they, you just open the gate, they walk through, they do it automatically and um there's total silence all you can hear is the the um the munching on grass and whatever they're eating well that's a lovely way to finish doug um <laughs> so unfortunately we've run out of time um but it but hopefully we can have more conversations like this um i want to say a huge thanks to emily for chairing the conversation uh big clap for emily <laughs> and um to Andrew and Charlie, Nikki and James, Doug and Johnny and the PFLA team, Jimmy in the background um, for uh, your great collaboration on this. And um, yeah, I've put in a little uh, feedback form um, into the chat box, a link. We'll send it as a follow-up email as well um, with any links around fencing and other things that have come up in this conversation. We'll try and do a follow-up on those things. Um, and please, if you haven't already, join the Mob Grazing Scotland Facebook group because um, you can continue having these conversations and asking these questions. And the farmers in the group will, will keep trying to share content with you, videos or images, if we haven't traumatised them too much from having done the, the videos in the rain. Um, but yeah, does uh, Johnny or, or Jimmy, do you want to say any final words from the PFLA? Thank you all for coming and, um, you know, the... Uh, PFLA and mob grazing is a, a fantastic way to get into cattle and sheep. Go for it.